Good afternoon. Today I'm reading from The Christian Archetype, a Jungian commentary on the life of Christ by Edward F. Edinger. I'm reading from Chapter 8, Arrest and Trial. He said, My kingdom is not of this world, but kingdom it was all the same. That was quoted from C.G. Young speaking, page 97. This is the biblical passage, Arrest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of the sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves, from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast, and forthwith he came to Jesus, and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they, and laid hands on Jesus, and took him. Matthew 26, 45-50 The tragic drama now hastens to its end, with Christ's encounter with the hostile multitude. This term, oklos, crowd, mob, refers to an unorganized multitude in contrast to demos, the people as a body politic. The corresponding verb, oklio, means to disturb by a mob or tumult, to be troublesome. It refers to collective man or mass man who is boisterous, demanding, and inclined to riot. Crowds have been mentioned earlier in the gospel account. For example, Matthew 4, 25, quote, and there followed him great crowds of people, unquote. At the triumphal entry into Jerusalem and a very great multitude, Oklos, spread their garments in the way, and the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Matthew 21, 8 and 9. We cannot avoid the impression that with the triumphal entry, Christ played to the crowd in the sense that he accepted its collective projection of the Son of David, an explicit reference to the Messiah. All collectivities are unconscious psychic organisms of great power and danger. I'll read that again. All collectivities are unconscious psychic organisms of great power and danger. They embody archetypal energies without the mediation of a conscious ego, and hence are notoriously fickle. The bigger the crowd, the more negligible the individual becomes, but the carrier of consciousness is the individual. Jung adds, did Christ perchance call his disciples to him at a mass meeting? Did the feeding of the 5,000 bring him any followers who did not afterwards cry with the rest, crucify him. And we might add, was not the crowd that hailed him son of David the same one that afterwards cried, crucify him, when it learned that his kingdom was not of this world? With the arrest of Christ, not only does the fickle crowd betray him, which is to be expected, but also one of his disciples. The trail is a theme of individuation because it pertains to the phenomenology of the opposites. It is another word for enantiodromia. There's a footnote. Enantiodromia means a running counter to. In the philosophy of Heraclitus, it is used to designate the play of opposites in the course of events. The view that everything that exists turns into its opposite from Psychological Types, Collected Work 6, paragraph 708. I'll begin that paragraph again. With the arrest of Christ, not only does the fickle crowd betray him, which is to be expected, but also one of his disciples. Betrayal is a theme of individuation because it pertains to the phenomenology of the opposites. 
It is another word for enantiodromia. In a situation of conflict between opposing values, an individual reverses allegiance and opens the gates to the enemy. The traitor has always been despised by both sides because he violates a sacred value of collective psychology, namely fidelity to identity with the group. Loyalty and betrayal are a pair of opposites. Loyalty to the future may require betrayal of the past or vice versa. In a sense, Christ betrayed his collective Jewish heritage. He was a heretic and therefore was punished as a traitor. This corresponds to the psychological fact that at a certain stage of development, the individual may be obliged to betray collective loyalties to achieve individuation. Later, the fruits of that crime may become a contribution to the collective. According to John 13, 26 and following, Judas is given his terrible fate at the Last Supper. After Christ announces that one of his disciples will betray him, he is asked who it will be. He replies, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Certain medieval pictures show Satan as a tiny demon entering the mouth of Judas as Christ gives him a morsel. It is as though Christ fed Judas his assigned destiny at that moment, and Judas dutifully carried it out. This may explain why the betrayal is accomplished with a kiss, and why Christ calls Judas friend as he receives the kiss. It is an act of love to lead a person to his proper destiny. It was Christ's destiny to be crucified. Therefore, he calls Judas friend and reacts angrily when Peter suggests he could avoid that fate. Quote, Jesus began to make it clear to his disciples that he was destined to go to Jerusalem and suffer grievously at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes to be put to death and to be raised up on the third day. Then, taking him aside, Peter started to remonstrate with him. Heaven preserve you, Lord, he said. This must not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle in my path, because the way you think is not God's way, but man's. Matthew 16, 21 to 23 the Jerusalem Bible. Then the trial before Caiaphas in Scripture. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus saith unto him. Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye shall have heard his blasphemy. What think thee? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Matthew 26, 57-66 Christ is accused of threatening to destroy the holy temple, the dwelling place of Yahweh's presence. That was, in fact, his hidden intention, as revealed by the development of the Christian myth. He was thus a traitor to the old dispensation, 
the established collective container of religious values. This explains Caiaphas's attitude when he says in John 11:50, it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. The expressed fear of the priest was that if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation, John eleven forty eight. But even without the Romans, Christ threatens Jewish orthodoxy. He is therefore on trial for heresy. For a religious community, heresy is spiritual treason, more dangerous than treason to the state. He can measure the degree of psychic threat by the intensity of the defensive reaction invoked. By that measure, heresy for the true believer is the ultimate threat. It threatens the supreme psychic value and is therefore more dangerous than death, which threatens only physical existence. It was this order of reaction that Christ constellated among the Jewish priests. Heresy trials, of course, miss the whole point of the reality of the psyche. For the orthodox believer of any creed, the psyche does not yet exist as an autonomous entity but only as a metaphysical hypostasis. It is this state of affairs that Christ is challenging. He admits that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and this seals his physical doom. In the context, this is not inflation. It is a witness to the reality of the transpersonal psyche as consciously manifested in the individual, the essential feature of individuation trial before Pilate, scripture says. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. John 18, 33-37. For Caiaphas, the crucial question was, Are you the Son of God? For Pilate, it is, are you a king? These are the religious and political versions of the same question. Psychologically, the question is, do you have an inner transpersonal authority which takes priority over collective religious and political authority? To have such an authority makes one, symbolically speaking, a son of God and a king. That's the end of chapter 8.